We've taken a week off, mostly, for professors to be able to transition their class to online, for students to get things in order, move out, do whatever you need to do to be able to take classes online. I'm sure it's a lot more challenging for professors than for students that are familiar with this technology. So this is the first day of class after spring break. So what we're going to do, essentially, we have three lectures that I posted on Sakai for last week. Now, we weren't in class then. You didn't have assignments. You weren't doing anything then. So essentially what we're going to do is that over the next three weeks, we're going to have 12 lectures all together instead of nine. So you can take your time. You can look at all of those. I know some people have told me they've already looked at those lectures, but what I really want to avoid is shortchanging you so that you only get part of the course that you would have gotten normally. So that's going to be our approach, that next, this Wednesday, in fact, you were supposed to have an exam. Instead of having an exam, we're not going to have anything. So you can take that extra time catch up on some of those other lectures. But what we're, the point that we are in the class is that we just finished talking about vertebrates. And we looked at vertebrates in relation to invertebrates. We looked at vertebrates in relation to chordates and saw that there were some invertebrate chordates. We looked at these different vertebrates, jawless fish, of which there's not very many, cartilaginous fish, of which there's quite a few, some very interesting ray fin fishes, of which there's a lot, many, many representatives, some lobe fin fishes that have largely gone extinct, but the coelacanth remains. And then we looked at tetrapods. No amphibians really to speak of. Reptiles, we looked at those, we looked at birds, and here we are finishing up mammals. So we looked at these different types of mammals, very interesting, very well adapted to their environment. Not that many species, but it doesn't matter. We're, we can still spend a fair amount of time talking about marine mammals. People are really interested in marine mammals. And this is where we are then now. The, the rest of the semester, basically, now that we're starting this online version of the class, we're going to be talking about marine ecosystems. So... We're going to go through these different types of ecosystems, starting with ones that are close to shore, along the coast, which are very dynamic, very interesting. A lot of different niches to be filled, a lot of variety of organisms, very, uh, very diverse ecosystems in terms of the, the conditions, the habitat you find there. And so a lot of different organisms as well. Very interesting along these the shoreline, basically. Then we're going to move to the open ocean, spend uh, some time talking about a large portion of the ocean, but it's more remote, difficult to study. We know less about it. Some hard things to understand how they work. Then we're going to look at these more extreme environments. Most of the ocean is would, would class, be classified as deep sea. It's deep. It's dark. There's not much productivity there, but uh, that's most of the ocean, the majority of it. However, it's a specialized environment in terms of being rather extreme, high pressure, cold, and uh, low temperature. Oxygen is a problem some places. So we're going to talk about the deep sea and then the poles, polar ecosystems. And then finally, the last couple of lectures, we're going to talk about humans and marine ecosystems. There's a lot of humans on Earth, and humans have a big influence on marine ecosystems in a number of different ways. Well, today, we're going to start out with estuaries. What is an estuary? What, to, what does it mean the physical characteristics that separate it make it so unique from the rest of the ocean, make it a, a different type of ecosystem that has specialized organisms in it. 
types, the productivity. That's one of the reasons why humans are so interested in estuaries, why we've had this relationship with estuaries for thousands of years. And then what is it you need to do to be able to survive in an estuary? We'll see it's a very good habitat in some respects, but it's a very challenging habitat in others. And then finally, we'll talk about some communities that are associated with estuaries, along the edge of estuaries, sometime in the middle of estuaries, but a lot of them closely associated with estuaries. We may not have time to get to that last F communities, but then we'll do that on Friday. So what is an estuary in the first place? Well, basically, it's where fresh raw water runs into the ocean. Now, you might think that there's a river or a, a, a creek that runs into the ocean. That doesn't necessarily form an estuary. So there's some other component to it, and that is that there's a, a physical space. There's a boundary that encloses some body of water where fresh water and salt water is mixing. One of the reasons, as I mentioned before, that we as humans are so interested in estuaries is because they're so productive. Estuaries are shallow. That means there's a lot of sunlight that reaches the water. They're obviously close to shore, and there's a big influx of nutrients in terms of runoff from land and there are, uh, the, in combination with the light, light and nutrients, in terms of photosynthesis, that's a good recipe for success. So with a lot of nutrients and a lot of light, there's a lot of primary productivity of photosynthesis. And so uh, there are a lot of different niches that are filled, especially in these uh, these ecosystems or communities that are associated with estuaries, maybe not so much in the, in the body of water itself, but along the edges. And humans have been taking advantage of estuaries for a long time. George Washington used to go out and fish for herring, some, some bait fish, when times were good off of the Mount Vernon and the, the, off the Potomac. And so even farther, longer ago than that, thousands of years, people have been harvesting things from estuaries. These days, things that people are really interested in, oysters, crabs, scallops, shrimp, some fish that people like to catch and eat, flounder, fluke, tarpon, big sport fish along the U.S. East Coast, striped bass and bluefish, a lot of bait fish, herring. So estuaries are really important for a lot of different species, both invertebrates and vertebrates. It's one of the reasons why there's so much interest in estuaries, even though if you look at the proportion of the ocean, it's actually formed by estuaries. First of all, some people would argue it's not even part of the ocean. It's a diluted salt water. It's a, it's a transition between fresh water and salt water, whatever the case is. It's a very small proportion of the ocean, and but it is uh, very productive. Well, let's look at the physical characteristics of estuaries. There's some kind of an input of fresh water, first of all, but it's a uh, it's bounded by some land. It could be uh, a bay, estuaries, it's some kind of uh, physical separation from the rest of the ocean. And you've got fresh water coming in. It could be a big river. It could be a number of small streams, but there's some input of fresh water and it mixes with salt water. So you don't have full strength seawater. You don't have fresh water, but you've got something in between. And so we're gonna look at a number of different types of estuaries in a minute. And we're going to see they form different ways. They have different physical characteristics. And not surprisingly, they have different organisms that are found in them. But what they share in common, whether you're talking about one formed this way or one formed that way, or one that has this type of salinity gradient or that type, is that they're, they're isolated from the ocean, the rest of the ocean, by some physical feature. And the second thing is,
that there's this mixture of freshwater and seawater. Those are the characteristics you're going to find in all these different estuaries. Well, let's look at a couple of different ways that you can view estuaries or types of estuaries. And we're going to look at two different ways. There's a number of different definitions of estuaries. Over the years, people have characterized estuaries in a, a number of different ways. We're going to focus on two main ways that you can distinguish between estuaries. The reason why people bother differentiating between ecosystems in the first place is because they have different characteristics. I mean, they're formed different ways, but in the end, they have different patterns of mixing of seawater with freshwater, which results in different organisms. They have different types of substrate, the different types of, of input of, of organic matter and nutrients, which results, again, in different types of organisms that are found there. So we're going to look at estuaries two ways. One, in terms of their geologic history. Two, in terms of the pattern of seawater and freshwater mixing. So let's do that. Well, in terms of the way that they were formed, basically you've got a river that's flowing into the ocean, or you've got some kind of uh, indentation where fresh water is running into the ocean. Now, when sea level rises, that body of water, that enclosure, starts to be filled not just with fresh water, but with seawater. So on the east coast of the U.S., most estuaries are coastal plains. It's low, flat land where there's a river that runs into the ocean and as sea level rises, then that plain is filled up with seawater, but you've got fresh water running into it. It's separated from the rest of the ocean. So you've got a coastal plain. As sea level goes down, then these estuaries will would if it turn into uh, just rivers. There's no input of fresh of uh, seawater. On the west coast of the U.S. and other places where there's more volcanic activity and geological movement, plates moving past one another, for instance, like on the U.S. west coast, you've got tectonic estuaries that are formed over geologic time from some... some uh, geologic event that creates uh, an input of fresh water or river, something like that, and then the sea level rises, and you've got this mixture of salt water and fresh water. So San Francisco Bay is a big estuary on the west coast, and there's other ones where the, the origin of the estuary, what set this freshwater seawater interface up in the first place, was some kind of tectonic event. There's also glaciers that resulted in pathways where fresh water runs into the, to the ocean. And these glacier-derived estuaries are fjords. When the sea level comes up, it's just like a coastal plain or it's like a tectonic estuary. There's fresh water coming in, the sea level rises, and these indentations are filled partly with seawater, but there's fresh water input as well. There's also estuaries where it's not full strength seawater, but it's not freshwater, on the backside of islands, barrier islands, along the US East Coast, especially down in the Carolinas and Georgia and and then around in the Texas coast, you have these barrier islands. Behind the islands, there's freshwater input. And so it's a physically separated body of water from the rest of the ocean that's got an input of fresh water, so it's not full-strength seawater. It's not fresh water. It's an estuary. So in terms of how these were formed, there's a number of different types of estuaries. And maybe that's interesting more if you're uh, interested in geology. In terms of biology, we'll see there's other things to take into consideration. So if you look at these figures here, the one on the left, there's Delaware Bay, and there's Chesapeake Bay. Those are coastal plain estuaries. The one in the middle, there's 
these barrier islands behind the islands you can see some of these inlets where fresh water comes in those are bar built estuaries and then on the far right you have all this glaciation which the, the glaciers when they're gone filled up with there's a river running through the the indentation formed by the glacier running into the ocean and you've got these these big uh indentations up into the land that we call fjords fresh water coming in salt water mixing now there's some some uh fjords that don't necessarily have fresh water input and then it's just it's like an inlet of the ocean so those are three different types what's more interesting i think is the type of estuary in terms of the conditions that are found there because that's going to influence the type of organisms that you find there and really you can look at these estuaries in terms of how the fresh water and the salt water mixes i'll show you a figure in a, in a minute but basically salt water moves in to this area and fresh water moves into this area so they they meet and the pattern by which that fresh water and salt water is mixed is uh, what leads to this classification. Salt wedge estuaries, well mixed estuaries, or partly mixed estuaries. Some places you've got a big river that's resulting in the input of a lot of fresh water. Other estuaries, you don't have one big river. You've got a little river. You've got a bunch of creeks. You've got some streams. You've got fresh water coming in, but it's not in this big river that results in the, a large volume of fresh water in one body coming in. Other places, you have strong tides where a lot of seawater comes in, and it's almost like a river running in the opposite direction in when the tide's coming in, or a then the tide goes out, then the, the current moves in the opposite direction. There's these strong tidal currents that organisms experience. So let's look at these three different types. Salt wedge, well mixed, and partially mixed estuaries. Well, if you consider the interface where freshwater and salt water are mixing, this is what's going on here. You've got some kind of freshwater input from the river. Fresh water is flowing down from the river towards the ocean. You've got some sort of seawater input from the ocean. Seawater is moving in. If it's a strong tidal flux, if it's a strong tidal current, then that there, there can be quite a bit of salt water moving in. It can be a big, basically, wedge of salt water moving in. Now, the density of seawater is about 1.027. 1.03 basically fresh water as you probably know it has a density close to one pure water has a density of one so 1.03 is more dense than one seawater will sink more dense than fresh water so it's on the bottom but there's different strengths of fresh water moving in and there's different strengths of seawater moving in and it results in different patterns of this mixing so let's look at three of these, three different ways. One is if you've got if you've got a fairly strong tides, you've got a pretty strong input of seawater. As the tide comes up, when the tide's coming in, there's a strong influx of seawater. When the tide's going out, then the seawater is moving in the opposite direction. You also have a fairly strong input of fresh water. The density difference results in freshwater being on the top and seawater being on the on the bottom. So when the tide comes up, the wedge moves into the estuary. When the tide goes out, the wedge moves out of the estuary. And as a result, if you're at the surface and you're moving down to the bottom, then you're moving into more, stronger and stronger seawater, more and more saline water. It's moving up from the bottom up to the surface. You're moving through water that's more and more fresh and less saline. There's also well mixed estuaries where there's not as much of a strong input of fresh water, not as much of strong input of seawater either. And so 
as you move from the river towards the ocean, you have this gradual change becoming more and more saline, more and more like the ocean. As you move from the ocean farther up the river, you have a gradual change where the salinity becomes less and less. And it's really this, it's a transition along the, uh, the distance of the river, basically. The distance of the estuary, where you have a gradient becoming more and more saline, or if you're moving up away from the ocean and the river, more and more fresh. And then there's partially mixed estuaries, where you've got a relatively strong flow of fresh water and a strong flow of seawater, where they're, they're partly mixed. You have some mixing that's taking place. It's not necessarily a big salt wedge where if you go down to the bottom, you've run into salt, salt water that's pretty saline. Well, let's look at these diagrammatically, at least the first two, and you'll see what I mean. On this top figure, there's a, a well-mixed estuary. You've got fresh water coming in. It's not that strong, and the fresh water comes and dilutes the estuary, the water in the estuary, as it moves farther away from the river, closer to the mouth of the ocean. You've got seawater coming in. Full-strength seawater, as you may remember, is about 35 parts per thousand. So all the way on the right of this figure, that would be about 35 parts per thousand fresh water as a, a salinity of zero. And so you have the fresh water coming in, you have the salt water coming in, you have the fresh water going out, salt water. So you have this gradient. If you're starting at the ocean, you start out at relatively high salinity water, moving farther and farther up the river until you get to all fresh water. If you're at the surface, Say you're at the surface where that 30 parts per thousand number is, and you go down to the bottom, you're in this relatively constant salinity water. It's 30 parts per thousand at the surface. It's 30 parts per thousand at the bottom. On the bottom, you see this saltwater wedge where you've got this fairly strong input influx of seawater on the bottom. It's less dense than fresh water, so it remains on the bottom. You have mixing, so there's mixing that's that's mixing these two, so it's not pure salt water on the bottom and pure fresh water on the top, but it, there's a gradient that that is somewhat from the bottom to the surface because you've got the salt wedge, very saline water on the bottom, and you've got fresh water on the top. And so if you started where that uh, at the surface where that 10 parts per thousand and the 20 parts per thousand meet, and you went down, you could be in water that's about 10 parts per thousand. You go down a little ways, you're in water that's 20 parts per thousand. You go down closer to the bottom, you eventually you get into water that's about 30 parts per thousand. Now, that's a big change. Your salinity has tripled moving from the surface to the bottom as opposed to that mixed estuary in the top where... You can go from the surface down to the bottom, and the salinity is pretty constant. All right, well, let's talk about productivity in these estuaries. Now, this is one of the reasons why people are so interested in estuaries. One of the reasons why humans have so much interactions with estuaries. So this will be a good place to stop for this first lecture. Now I have to split these lectures in two because uploading them to the internet takes some time and it's uh, difficult to upload a 50-minute lecture. It takes a long time to get it. And so we're splitting these lectures into two parts, as you probably noticed. So this is the end of the first part.